a really interesting idea about New York City, which is what is the nature of nature, so to speak. And um, to that end, we have Eric Sanderson, who is the senior conservation ecologist at uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, who's going to sort of speak a little bit more about this idea of nature and history and what it means to kind of our, our broader uh, urban, urban fabric um, he formerly was working on the Manahatta Project, um, which explored the history of, uh, of nature and ecology in uh, Manhattan, and now he's working on the five boroughs in the Wailikia Project. Uh, <laughs> so uh, come up and uh, let us know what you got. Uh, good evening, everybody. So, so I'm not an urban designer or architect. I'm an ecologist, but I want to say that some of my best friends are urban designers and architects. <laughs> and uh, because you're so creative, and, and I, I feel so lucky to live here in New York City where we have such dedicated public servants. But I want to challenge you. In fact, I want to dare you to think about this place as a natural place, as an ecological place, and not, Grace's presentation is perfect, but not just the parks, but everywhere. I'd like to show you what it looked like uh, 400 years, 402 years ago today. Today's Marahat today. Um, what it looked like to Henry Hudson when he sailed into Manhattan, or when he sailed into New York Harbor and saw Marahat, the island of many hills. Um, and I think you know you need to sear this image into your mind and think about it every time you go to work, everything you do, and these images that follow, hopefully. Images that follow. <laughs> yeah, don't sear this one into your lives. Here we go. So, so when we think about ecology, we have to think at, at big scales. We have to think of the whole city. We have to think of the island as a place that, that's on the edge of a continent, that's part of the Hudson River Canyon, that's part of the. Whoops. Is it disappearing for you too? <laughs> I don't know what's going on back there. Oh. That it's a place that had ecosystems. I don't know if you can tell, but there's 15 different ecosystems in this picture. Uh, home to over uh, a thousand different species, plants and animals, one of which was people. And what we try and do through ecology is show the connections between these things, between the land and the disturbance uh, factors, between the ecosystems and all the species that live in those ecosystems. Um, the build up over time, oops, sorry, I guess I didn't take away the animations. Uh, that, that come to the 55 different ecosystem types that once lived on Manhattan or within a thousand meters of its shoreline. And that together that these form what we call a mirror web or an ecosystem web, where each point on this diagram is a different plant or different animal, and each gray line represents a habitat connection, a, a soil or water or, or a shelter connection between those species and everything else in the mirror web. And if it, you zoom out, as I hope it will in a minute, you'll see that all these connections create um, create a, a cluster and a network of which there's one dot. Do you see that red dot? That's the human being dot, right? I mean, we, we spend all our time thinking we're, we're the center of the world and we live in these great social networks and these economic things that, that are all inside that little dot that you can barely see on the diagram. And we ignore so much of the rest of the world, so all, the, all the lives of all these other creatures and all the connections between them. And this is the, this is the story of, of Western civilization, right? Just imagine that nature is the foundation on which humanity will build arts and architecture and science and technology and language, all these, all these great things that we admire. And yet we're realizing that the limits of that, that the, the foundation can't support everything we want to build upon it, especially here at the beginning of the 21st century. The, the environmental movement gave this idea of humanity and nature as these sort of two co-equal systems interact with each other and, and slowly humanity is pushing over nature. But even that's not the right, right thing because humanity doesn't exist outside of nature. Humanity exists inside of nature, right? All the time, even right now. Even right now here underground in this building with these weird lights. That we're, <laughs> we're, we're a part of nature, that we're breathing air and, and taking in food and energy and that we're having interactions, both, both direct interactions and these indirect interactions that go, go way beyond us and go, go way out into the world. Most of these are around habitat, right? Food, water, shelter, family, and meaning. Most of these, this, this meaning one is the one that cities were built around, right? The idea that you could build all those other things. And what's exciting about New York City today and cities around the world today is we're discovering that meaning comes from those other, those other things, from 
from food and from water and family and from shelter. And if we do those things right, we can find just as much meaning in our ecological interactions. And we can build cities that are great habitat for us. So when we look at this, we need to think not just about each site. We need to think about, about the edge and the relationship of the edge to, to the mountains. Anyway, if you go to our website, you can, you can find out more about this. And I hope you will. I hope you will explore down to the level of the block. Um, it's Wailikia. Uh, backslash explore. Wilikia means my good home in Lenape in the Native American language of the people that live here. And you can go to any block on Manhattan and eventually any block in New York City and, and zoom into that block, uh, find out who lived there, all the plants and animals, how high it used to be, where the streams used to be, um, the, the way the water moved to that block, the way that it provided shelter so many to the different organisms. Where are we? Um, and that you, can, that you can actually understand the ecology of the place and look for solutions that you can build into your urban designs. So you can pick a block, 61st and 62nd, between Park Avenue and Madison, and, and go down and see the 300 species that used to live in that block, right? I mean, we're, we're so happy when we get a couple trees and pits along the road, but it's such a small, small proportion of what's possible, of the potential of that, of that place. And we need to build this into our visions of the city. The, the city that's going to last for, for hundreds of years beyond us. Uh, a city with, with streams, perhaps, and, and I don't think any, car, any more cars in the future. Um, and forests that actually work as forests as well as being beautiful for us. Not a city that doesn't have architecture or people, a city that has those things, but that works as an ecological place as well. Um, and that works at neighborhood scales. You can imagine the Upper East Side with green roofs and the streams running through and, and windmills and tidal mills and the in the East River, we can imagine that the place that's responding to its ecology, and the ecology is an example of, of what the place can build. Um, and this isn't true just in the city, but in fact for our whole region, for our whole country. Um, to try and imagine a world that has just as many people in it, but living in, in divan, uh, dense, unique, transit-oriented, uh, great cities, but ones that also allow agriculture and wild areas and, and, and working waterways right beside us. Um, all around us, and that will be the kind of enduring landscape that lasts for as long as, as we want to live there. Um, and so uh, working with, with Alex and some other people in the room, um, we're building a grant that's going to add on to our website and allow anybody to zoom into their block on Manhattan and change it and see what the carbon and the water and biodiversity consequences of that block are, and then push a button and say how that would extrapolate for the whole city. So that we can actually imagine how nature and the city work together, how they complement each other, how they're, they're actually part of the same place, part of the same planet, and we can give a vision of the future and a sustainable life uh, for the kids. <laughs>